I grew up in a Baptist church and of course from day one you're immersed in music and then I had an opportunity my brother wanted to quit piano and I asked if I could take his place and I was just getting ready to turn five and I think uh, that very early um, beginnings it, it helped me with my sense of pitch and just getting it into my bones I guess and I guess um, I really wanted to to see how far I could progress with that as as a little kid and even though it's always a challenge to do the the uh, practicing when everybody else is playing ball but uh, when I was in the second grade I had this vision of starting a music store where all the music was written by me I, of course I didn't understand the whole thing but uh, I always had this uh, urge to create. In fact, when I was in the third and fourth grades, I would read all the biographies about the inventors because I was really wanting to invent something. But as I got older, I, I uh, found that I was not very much in mechanical reasoning and technical uh, the sense. So I, uh, I think that's where my creativity went back to music, the thing that I knew the best. Well, I think my uh, background in music is really varied. I took with a... Um, a piano teacher from the ages of four through the fourth grade. Then I picked up band, I played trumpet and band all the way through high school. As I got uh, into high school, I started playing a little bit with my buddies that were playing guitars and drums and that kind of thing. And so we had a top 40s band when I was a, a senior in high school and played in the, in the Battle of the Bands. And then uh, just intent that I was going into music and getting a, a music degree and uh, went to the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and then of course was immersed in more classical music so and even as I was studying that classical music I was doing little things on the side with uh, my buddies who played guitar and keyboards and that kind of thing so maybe I, I, I have a short attention span but the more noble way of describing that is that um, my interests are really varied I just enjoy uh, just getting into the language of music. I'm just so amazed when I hear the different styles of music and say, yeah, that's still music and this classical piece is still music. This is just an incredible force of humanity. I love to write in different styles because I think we have, uh, we define ourselves too, too tightly on what is worship music. We have uh, formulas of how, uh, what we need to do to create a vital, exciting, energetic service. And he said, no, there's, there's more than one way to do it. It doesn't have to be a trap set with a couple of guitars. We've got, I mean, you've got Celtic music and jazz. You've got classical, of course. There's just a wide palette. There's a great big menu there that I think that we don't take advantage of to express our faith and to reach out to people whose background is might not be classical or might not be alternative rock. Lots of languages there and I just love to immerse myself in them. It might be a little bit that I, I, I might be bored with one style and I just want to see, okay, what's on the other side of that curtain that I could use? And, and also, one of our responsibilities as composers is to, to offer something that everybody else can't offer and to, to find what your own uh, individual voice is. We talk about it often when I see John Purifoy. My very first piece, I, I wrote it for my own church and it was for their 25th anniversary and it was called Within These Walls. It's still one of my best pieces I've ever written. I think because back then I was working on one piece rather than a lot of pieces, but I pretty much put all of Christendom in one, one anthem and I sent it to John, and then uh, later on I saw him at a conference and said, hey, I sent you a piece. Yeah, Pepper, I, I know, that's a good piece. And he said, I'd like to give you some suggestions. I said, hey, I got time, let's go over to a church. And he spent like uh, an hour or two uh, that day uh, saying, okay, this needs to have more in it, or this needs to be simpler. And that night, I've never done this any other time in my life. That night, I stayed up all night working on that piece because I figured this could be my only chance to get a piece published. And then after it was published, I thought, you know, this could be my only piece ever published. And so five months before it came out, I, I was giving people my business card with the name of the piece written on the back of it. Just please look at it when it comes out. <laughs> so I was just, I think I sold about half of uh, what was sold 
of that very first piece. But it was it was the uh, bestseller for for Purefoy Publishing, uh, which is part of Lorenz now. So. Church music. I was taught this early in uh, seminary days that church music really is a functional kind of of art. Something in a concert hall, the music might stand a little bit more for art's sake. I mean, people would argue with me with that, but there, we're going for the high art. I just have, I just accepted the conclusion that this was a functional art and my composing was to help people express what they wanted to express. I'm, people say, where do your pieces come from? Where, does, where do your ideas come from? And I say, I'm always listening to how people express their faith and how they talk about their faith. And I try to find out what they're saying or wanting to say and then to give them a beautiful way to say it. There's a, another piece that comes to mind, uh, Sweet Are the Prayers of a Friend. Uh, that was inspired by my own home church, uh, Greystone Baptist in Raleigh. When we were sitting in a prayer meeting and I was just listening to people express their concerns and then listening to the prayers that were being lifted up and I thought that really is such a focal part of church ministry and why people are bond together and take the time to come together is to lift each other in prayer and there needs to be a song that helps them express that. So it says, sweet are the prayers of a friend uh, for a friend. Those who offer up and who lift us up in prayer, who pray us through struggles, through play, pray us through troubles, then you're helping them express rather than you expressing yourself and asking people to join you, I suppose. When I'm traveling around, one of the things that I always work on is, is bringing the music to life. Usually when I'm showing up, we've got a little more rehearsal time. And I know from my own experience, when you come in there on Wednesday and Thursday night and you need to come up with a new anthem for Sunday, I know our time constraints a lot of times will cause us to learn the piece, learn the notes, the words, and the rhythm and say, okay, we're gonna make it for Sunday. But I think the, the if, if there is a trend away from choral music in church, I think it's because we have sung choral music in, uh, in a boring way. We have not invested our, ourselves in it. Of course, you know, like I say, we're doing the best we can with the limited time, but somehow we have to make it come alive and make it vital and make it exciting, whatever the piece is. If it's a slow, legato piece, then it has to be sung with passion and human breath. If it's, if it's a fast, bouncy piece, then we need to get in there and really make it happen. Gospel, bring your gospel chops to it. To make the, the choral time in a service uh, real happening. And, and I'll tell people when I go there, we don't want after the choral, um, the choral worship or, or during the choral worship, we don't want people to say, okay, well, they're singing, isn't that nice? Well, they're doing the best they can, bless their hearts, uh, but we want it, them to be engaged and be moved by our choral music. I'll give Joe Martin credit on that. One time he called me up and said, hey, Pepper, I need some more singers. Would you like to go in tandem with me on a project at Carnegie? And uh, I jumped at it and had a good time and I thought, okay, well, you did Carnegie. Isn't that nice? All right, that's done. What's next? But when I started hearing the testimonies of my choir members and people that, other people from other churches that had gone on that, they would say things like, that was one of the most spiritual experiences of my life. It was the musical high point of my life. And I'm just still just, just beaming with the energy that, that happened on that night. And I said, okay, that's, I'm going to do that again. If, uh, I, and I really do keep doing it for the people. It's wonderful to have your music sung so magnificently in such wonderful halls as Lincoln Center and Carnegie with a giant orchestra. When the people show up for those Carnegie or Lincoln projects, one thing, they know the music cold. So it's a director's dream 
to come in and we rarely work on a note in those experiences. So you have uh, six to seven hours of rehearsal where you're just working on the fine points. We all have to come together and agree how we're going to approach this. And I tell people we, we need to use our Carnegie voice. We, we're a little bit straighter and a little more open, nice round tone rather than singing uh, like we're talking in tune. So we, we work on that some. And then I guess my thing is to, to make the music move and make it communicate. And so we're working on which syllable to, to emphasize and to make it sound human as we're singing this text. Uh, I tell the, the people we want to make that energy just leap off the stage. Not let the listener simply observe and listen, but just be impacted by our singing. Uh, one of my prayers when I go into a new place is, Lord, let me be a blessing. And you can just feel that energy of the people and feel like you're playing a special part in those people's lives as you're making this music. If I had a message to give to my younger self, I think I would probably say, hey, it's going to be okay. You are going to make, be able to make a contribution. When I was young, I was bound and determined that I was going to you know, do something with this music art. And I have been able to make a contribution. Uh, I'm not on network TV, but I, I'm gratified and just appreciate when people uh, express what my music has meant to them. And it has moved people in a deep way, in a, in a spiritual way. So I think that would be my message, that you, it, it's going to work out. I think often that it takes a lot of courage to create anything in, in choral music. And I think often, well, is this going to work? I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know if this is good. Am I wasting my time? Should I go out and mow the lawn instead of working on this choral piece? It takes courage to say, no. You can do this. Keep working on it. You know, as you get older, you have people saying, uh, people that you had in your youth choir at church come back to you say, you know, you made an impact on me and you gave me sort of a model of, of what it meant to be a faithful Christian and someone with integrity. We probably don't uh, value that nearly as much when we're younger as we should, but because at the end of the end of the road, it's not going to be how many pieces you publish, but what impact you had on people's lives. I think that's the ultimate value. Well, one word I would have for anyone and everyone that would be listening and, or, or watching this is I would encourage you to support everybody in this whole process. We are pretty much on the honor system in our choral music. And uh, as educators and church musicians, you would think that we would that would be enough. But the more that we support each other, is the more free that we can be to create. And I think uh, as we support each other, our level of musicianship and artistry, I think, can go higher. Often, I think as I'm creating, uh, I think, well, you cannot be doing this for the money. You gotta be doing it because you feel a passion. But I will confess that it really helps me to think, well, you are creating it and giving it and making a contribution to the people and musicians and churches and in schools. But maybe this will help my family and pay our bills at the same time. So uh, we need to support the publishers, the distributors, the, the composers, the arrangers, everything, so, so that we can continue to serve you with, with freedom and, and have and when you support us, we have more courage to offer you things that maybe is not the tried and true. We take more chances when we know you're going to back us up. So that would be my, uh, my encouragement and uh, exhortation for you today.